can't go like onto a website and find people who don't agree with the, you know the dominant culture and have like little discussion groups. You didn't have that. You were alone. You were done. You were out. And so, in exchange for testifying to the oneness of Allah, what is his apparent recompense? Exile. He's gone. And when he gets older, and finally, he receives word that he will have a son in his advanced age, and he is so thrilled, because of course there's the natural human impulse to want to have children, to want to go on, and there's the equally natural human impulse to have someone to take care of you. They didn't have health insurance. They didn't have a social safety net. It was your children. That was who took care of you. And so he receives word that he will have a son, and he is ecstatic. And yet after the son is born, when Ismail is only an infant, when he's very, very young, Allah says to him, take him and his mother and leave them in the valley of Becca. Just abandon them there. And what would you think? That if you left someone in that desert, you were leaving them there to die. We feel bad if we don't know where our kids are or they come home five minutes late. We feel terrible if we feel like something bad may have happened to someone. When we see someone we love in the least bit of pain, it eats at our heart. And he is being asked, leave your son and your wife in the scorching desert where there is nothing. If you've been to Mecca, there is nothing there. Now, of course, there are a lot of things, but there's, there's no plan. It's harsh. It's nothing like Medina, for example. There's no oasis. There was nothing. And leave them there. You have to trust that I, God is saying to him, that I will protect for them. I will take care of them. I want to see what kind of faith you have. And when he comes back years later to build the Kaaba, and he is again overjoyed, that his son has survived, he is married into the tribe of the Jorhum, and he is a part of a community that has been built up around an oasis of Zemzam, and he will build there a house of Zarhid, a house of worship. Along the way, he receives revelation that tells him, now you have to sacrifice your son. We have never been tried like this. He starts early in his life, being forced to leave his community. In fact, his community pushes him away. And then, when he finally has family of his own, and there is a community there, God is saying, who do you love more? Are there still any idols in your life? You cut down the stone idols, but that wasn't a problem. But do you love me more, or do you love your son? And both Ibrahim and Ismail May Allah be pleased with them and send his blessings upon both. Both agree to do this, and Ismail finds, says he is willing to do this. He accepts. Again, imagine someone in your life you love, and imagine being asked to do that. And of course, the people at the time knew it was wrong, and we know it is wrong. We have in the Quran, for example, the story of Habil and Qabil, the two sons of Adam, peace be upon him. And Cain killed Abel. This is a murder. People know murder is wrong. Right? People know the same things are wrong. And he is being asked to sacrifice his son. This is the greatness of Ibrahim. That he is tested in these ways, and he is not found wanting. And of course, in the end, he is not made to sacrifice his son. An animal is put in his place. His place. But the desire had been realized. The test had been passed. And this is not the kind of test that we are expected to pass. This is the test that only prophets are expected to pass. And I think we gain from it several things. The first is this. Your reason, your intellect will only take you so far. There are some very intelligent people out there who can't see the way their bias corrupts their intelligence. Stephen Hawking, for example, has insisted he found a way out of the Big Bang by positing something called imaginary time. So we don't have to deal with the creation of the universe because perhaps time runs time run sideways instead of backwards and forwards the way we know it to be. It doesn't deal with the problem that there is still a universe there. It doesn't get it. It's still a worship of nature. Cannot bring ourselves to get beyond this. 
Abraham starts with intellect. He starts with reflecting. He looks up at the night sky. He looks up at the sun and he says, is this my Lord? But he goes beyond that and we have to go beyond that. Islam is a rational religion, but reason takes you only so far. You have to love this. Because it tests you and it asks of you. And you build something through that. That is the first lesson we take from the life of Abraham, peace be upon him. The second, that Abraham was willing to stand up for his beliefs against his community, against his father, and finally against himself and his deepest instincts. If this is my son whom I love most in the world, God is saying, take him, I must take him. The third of this, the third of these lessons, is that the promise of Allah is true. And we don't know how it is true, we know it is true. And I'll explain to you how this works. When Ibrahim was young, peace be upon him, he smashed the idols to jolt his people into an awareness of the divine. His great, great, great grandson many times over, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he at the end of his life took down the idols that had returned and come into the Kaaba. But he did it from a position of strength. Thus, there was a connection. It passed over centuries, thousands of years, but it was there. The second point, Abraham was willing to stick out, and we have to be willing to pursue what our religion asks of us. We have to develop that strength. And when finally it comes to the promise of God, we know that Allah says, for example, in the Qur'an, describing the pleasures of paradise, or the punishment, the hardship of the hellfire. Now, we can't really comprehend these things, because these are beyond our capacity to comprehend. But I will give you an inkling of what this means. Ibrahim, alayhi salam, when he left his people behind, when he left everything behind, Look at how he was rewarded in this world. You are all here today because of what he did. This is our religion, subhanAllah, that we celebrate that a man was tested by God and passed the test, and for centuries ever since, all across the planet, we all celebrate this occasion. We send blessings upon him and his family, and look at who his descendants were. From the line of the prophet Isaac, the prophets that include Jacob and Joseph, Moses, Jesus, John the Baptist, David, and Solomon, may Allah be pleased with all of them and send his blessings upon all of them. And from the line of Ismail, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And this is just the recompense in this world. So can we imagine what we get in the next world? <coughs> that is what he got for his descendants and his name and his family. A new family was built after he had left behind his previous family, and that family exists throughout eternity because we remember it every time we pray. Can you imagine what God will give a person who passes those tests in this life, in the next life? If that is what you get in this life. So if you are down, if you are feeling like life is really tough and life is really tough at times, remember that. You may not see it right away, but it is there, it is true, and it is coming. And keep in mind that this is at the heart of Islam. The people at the time of the Prophet Muhammad lived in a world, peace be upon him, lived in a world where it was very hard to find food. If you walk out of this building, you can walk in five blocks in any direction and find a lot of restaurants. You can find anything you want. Food is everywhere available. So sometimes we don't realize the effect of it. You have a park right there, literally a few blocks away. And yet over and over again in the Quran, Allah says, to the people that if you do good, I will give you a garden. Can you imagine the impact it had on the people back then, who lived in the harshest, hottest, and least hospitable climate, that this is what God will give you, this kind of recompense. This is what is at the heart of our religion, and we should internalize, internalize it for ourselves and share it with others, and always keep in mind that whatever we face now, we will receive much more in recompense as long as we stay, stay true to the path. إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما الله and his angels and blessings upon the prophet O you who believe send blessings upon the prophet and salute him with respect Ya Allah we ask you to please forgive our sins Ya Allah we ask you 
to forgive our sins, our faults, and our shortcomings. Ya Allah, save us from death and depression, anxieties and worries. Ya Allah, give us the best of this life and the best of the next. Ya Allah, shower your mercy on us, on this community. Make, it, make us examples of good for our families and our neighborhoods. Ya Allah, give peace and contentment to all those who are suffering and deprived. Bring them strength and increase us all in patience. Ya Allah, give us the strength to stand for what is right, to work towards the betterment of ourselves, to honor you and worship you as befits your majesty. In Allah, Ya Amru bil Adr wal Ahsan wa Ida al Qurba wa Inhan al Fasha wa Al Qari wal Baghi Ya Aizukum la Alakum Tadakarun. Allah commands justice, doing good, and giving to friends and family. He forbids all indecency, evil, disorder, and rebellion. He instructs you that you might receive admonition. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Hayy Mubarak. You can hug now. Thank <laughs> you.